our worship service on this uh, St. Patrick's Day. I, um, we are eating downstairs after the service, and you're invited. There's uh, plenty of food, whether you signed up or not, so uh, plan to stay a little bit and grab an Irish meal and uh, celebrate. So, in terms of upcoming uh, events, the first thing is, on the opening hymn, there's six verses, we're only doing four, so don't jump in lustfully for verse five, or you'll be doing a solo. Um, coming up quickly on Holy Week, everything on a Sunday is at 10.15 in the morning, everything any other day of the week is at 7 p.m., so... Palm Sunday and Easter, 1015. Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, and the Great Vigil is at 7 here. And then shortly after Easter, on the 3rd of April, we start the Financial Peace University on Wednesday evenings. And you are uh, more than welcome to sign up. It's a Dave Ramsey Solutions uh, course. Uh, the younger you are, the better off you'll be if you take it. So. Uh, without any further ado, I invite you to stand and join in the brief order of confession and forgiveness. We begin this morning in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We've sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We've not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen.
of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. from above and for our salvation let us pray to the Lord for the peace of the whole world for the well-being of the church of God and for the unity of all let us pray to the Lord For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Let us pray. O God, with steadfast love, you draw us to yourself, and in mercy you receive our prayers. Strengthen us to bring forth the fruit of the Spirit, that through life and death we may live in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Amen. I believe the Apostle Jeremiah, 31, 31 to 36, said it to Zion in Babylon, laying her up exile under the oppressor, who had broken the covenant established at Sinai. Here the prophet looks to a day when God will make a new covenant with the people. There will be no need to teach the law because God will write it on their hearts. Here begins the reading. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke. Though I was her husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put the law within them. I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquities and remember their sins no more. The word of the Lord. Let us play responsibly Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. For I know my offenses, and my sin is ever before me. Indeed, I was born steeped in wickedness, a sinner from my mother's womb. Indeed, even the light of truth is within me, and without the hand of wisdom is within me. Remove my sins with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be purer than snow. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my wickedness. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. A reading from the book of Hebrews, chapter 5. 
Using priestly imagery and references to the Old Testament, the author explains how Christ lived in trusting obedience to God. And so God has made Christ the source of our eternal salvation. Here begins the reading. Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplication with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. The word of the Lord. Gospel according to St. John in the 12th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus entered Jerusalem for the last time to celebrate the Passover festival. Here, Jesus' words about seeds planted in the ground turn the disaster of his death into the promise of a harvest in which everyone will be get- gathered. Now, among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat fall into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. And Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out, and I when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are very late in the season of Lent, and the events of the Holy Week are literally right on us. This mimics, of course, the, the time in Jesus' public ministry where he went up to Jerusalem and he is bound and determined that he is going to work literally the will of him who sent me. And that will is that as 
the representative of Israel as God's incarnate self that propitiation be made for human sin. And there's only one place and one way where that can happen. It is for this purpose and this purpose alone that all of salvation history has been played out. Beginning from Genesis 3.15 at the fall, all the way up until this moment, God has been putting into play his plan that will overturn human sin, the fall of humanity, the fall of creation, so that he can put everything whole and complete and right back together again and launch all of creation the way he intended it before the fall. This is his great plan of salvation. And Jesus is the culmination of that plan. He's come into the world. He has taught. He has preached. He has done signs and wonders to demonstrate the inbreaking of the kingdom, the establishment of this new covenant. We hear about the new covenant from the prophet Jeremiah. In his day, in the 500s before Christ, the big superpower in the world was Babylon. The people of Jerusalem were being hard-pressed by this empire, just the way it had been 150 years before when it was the Assyrians. God had spared Jerusalem the first time around, and the people, instead of saying, it's a good thing that we were faithful to God and living in the covenant and so forth, they copped this attitude that, hey, we're special, we can just kind of keep the form of the covenant going, and God's going to protect us because, well, his house is here. And God was sending them prophets to say, repent, return, live in the covenant. I am not really interested in your little performance at the temple. I'm not interested in the barbecue. I want you in real relationship with me. And they blew him off. They played at it, but they didn't take him seriously. And prophets like Jeremiah kept saying things more and more and more blatantly to the point where Jeremiah got thrown into an abandoned cistern and would have died of exposure except for an Ethiopian eunuch who would go and supposedly throw out the garbage, but he was really throwing food and water down his hole to keep Jeremiah alive. The king repented of it and dragged him out just before he died, chained him into a watchtower, and when the city fell to the Babylonians, King Nebuchadnezzar goes, I don't know who this scrawny guy is, but if he's the enemy of my enemy, he's my friend. And Jeremiah was let free. He eventually was kidnapped by Jews and taken to Egypt, and then they assassinated him because he wouldn't prophesy good things for them. He said, I'll only tell you what the Lord tells me to say. But the new covenant that Jeremiah talks about is one that is not going to be built on ritual observance or pious practices like phylacteries and prayer shawls and mezuzahs, but on genuine relationship with Yahweh. He's foretelling the coming of the Messiah and the covenant that Messiah will make not only with the people of Israel and Judah, but with them and through them to everybody. Jesus comes to inaugurate this new covenant and you can understand his ministry by following the pattern of the first exodus and looking at similar things in Jesus' career. So now he has come to the point where it's put up or shut up, to be honest. He has this signal to him of the Greeks, and he says, now the hour has come. He asks the question, should I run away from this? This is what it's been all about since the beginning. This is why I came, is to go to the cross and to fight this fight now and here. He chose, when he could have easily 
A, never have bothered to come at all, or B, called it off at any point in time. He chose to stay with the plan. He came to do God's will, and he was going to do it all the way to the bloody end. And so he does. I think as Christians, sometimes when we're looking at the life of Jesus, um, we kind of do two different things. We, uh, we certainly have a culture where you get a little rubber armband with WWJD on it for um, what would Jesus do. I heard of one young Lutheran that had that on, and his mother said it doesn't stand for what would Jesus do, but um, worldwide juvenile delinquent. <laughs> so apparently he had the sinning part down really good. We, we make it kind of trivial with that, or we don't bother at all. And yet the pattern of the Christian life is discipleship. In German, it's nach Folge, to follow after. The student follows the master. And what the master is doing is what the student does. What the master perceives and thinks and says is dominant in the perception, thinking, and speaking of the disciple. And when Jesus is bent on following the instruction of the Father, following his plan to its full completeness, and unwilling to waver in that, unwilling to turn aside, unwilling to do anything but to do it and do it right, that's a characteristic that I think ought to be what one sees in the disciples of Jesus. We ought to be people, borrowed from Jesus, when we say yes, it means yes. And when we say no, it means no. It ought to be a given that the disciple of Jesus Christ can be trusted. There's a story that comes out of the Middle East a couple of decades ago now. Um, King Hussein of Jordan passed away, and his son Abdullah came to the throne. It's the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan, so many of their customs and traditions go way back in Arabian tribal society and kingdoms to include taking loyalty oaths. So Abdullah is king, and all of the major leaders in the kingdom came forward and knelt down in front of him and put their hand to the inside of his thigh and swore an oath of fidelity to the king. This is a custom that goes back be before Abraham, so it's ancient. Well, there's one individual who was the commanding general of the Jordanian army and a Christian. There are Christians in Jordan. There are Christian Arabs. And this guy came forward when it was his turn and started to kneel down. And the king stood up and grabbed him by his elbows. And he said, I know that you are a disciple of the prophet Jesus. And if you say yes, it means yes. And if you say no, it means no. Tell me you'll be loyal. You do not need to swear an oath. How about that? Guess who enjoys real loyalty from a certain part of his population? It ought to be characteristic of us, because in this story it's characteristic of Jesus. When we look at him, Yes, he's doing things that will never be called on to do. You can't die for the sins of anybody, much less the whole world. But you can follow him. You can listen to his words. You can share his perceptions. You can speak truth from what you learn from him. And you can be trustworthy. And I think that that's a real challenge in this day and age in the United States. 
There's a lot of political pressure being thrown around left, right, and center about you should believe this, or you should believe that, or you should do this, or you should do that. It's very difficult in turbulent political times to be a person of truth, to be a person of honor, to exercise integrity. And yet, that's what we're called to do. What Jesus is doing for us, and we're, we're learning this in Romans chapter 8, he goes to the cross, to the place where there is so much evil, so much brokenness, so much death, and he pulls all of it in, and the consequences of it, and the sources of it, and he defeats it, and he judges it for what it is, and he carries it to condemnation, and to hell, and death, and leaves it there. And on the third day, rises from the dead, and he extends that new risen life to his disciples. He says, follow me. He gives us his Holy Spirit. He restores us to our vocation as the image bearers of God in creation and calls us to go forth as his witnesses. And what we learn from Paul in Romans is that we too will go to places where there is so much pain that it's hard to put into words. And yet the Christian will be there coming alongside of people and praying for them, even if it's a groan that is so deep you can't find words for it. And the Holy Spirit who is within us will communicate all of those concerns to the Father. That's our vocation. That's how the gospel is borne witness to. That's how the, the kingdom breaks into the world. And that's our job. That's our vocation. That's what we're called to do. As people of integrity who go where the Lord leads us and in, are involved in that intercessory prayer. I'll close with one quick story. Several years ago, there was a famine in Africa and the celebrities of the world decided that they were going to support bringing aid in. I think it was in the Horn of Africa. And one of the people that they got to go and show the flag was Bono from the rock band U2. And Bono's a Christian. Uh, he was born and raised in uh, Northern Ireland. He says, the Christ I love. The church? Not so much. But he went, and he told this organization that invited him that he would take on the representative role as long as it was a real role, and that they stayed with it until the famine was over. And so he went back the second year, and there was a whole lot of less people there. It wasn't cool now. And so the number of celebrities began to dwindle. He went back the third year, and he said it was him and his little entourage and a bunch of nuns <laughs> from Catholic Social Services. It wasn't cool anymore, but the people were still hungry and without water and sick. And it was the disciples of Jesus Christ who stayed with them. I think that mimics Christ. I don't know about you, but I hope that that would be true of me. Amen.
We confess our faith together with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. Trusting in God's promise to reconcile all things, let us pray for the church, the well being of creation, and a world in need. God of the covenant, through the church you draw us into community. We give thanks for the means of grace around which we gather. Inspire writers, musicians, and artists whose creative gifts adorn our worship. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of all that exists, you lavish the earth with, with extravagant beauty. Preserve the rich and complex diversity of living things. Support local, national, and international efforts to protect the environment for future generations. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Almighty God, we pray for those caught up in the war between Israel and Hamas, that civilians would be, be protected, hostages set free, criminals punished, and leaders made wise enough to make peace founded on justice. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of goodwill, you restore what is broken. We pray for any experiencing estrangement, conflict, grief, or illness. Protect and comfort all who are vulnerable, especially. Ingrid, Angel, Marcy, Jessica, Lorraine, Carol, Bruce, Mason, Kyle, Tiffany, Rosalind, Corey, Brad, Marty, Elena, Donnie, Donald, Bob, Brenda, and Larry, Jesse, Cheryl, Don, Frank and Brenda, Nyla, Gabby, Grace, Mary Ruth, Audrey, Sandy, Kathy and George, Janet, Bobby, Carrie, Joe, the Bigler family. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of every time and place, you are with us. Support ministries of prayer and pres present in this congregation presence in this congregation, especially the Wednesday and Sunday adult studies, the Good News Club, Bible 2 School, Scout Troop 35, Columbia Meals on Wheels, the Columbia Food Bank, Columbia Dream Center, Faith Community Church, and GIFT Women's Ministry. Move us to reach out to any who are homebound, lonely, grieving, in treatment, or ill. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of promise, we give thanks for the saints whose faith inspires us, especially Patrick, missionary to Ireland, whom we commemorate today. Grant us faith to trust in your everlasting love. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Accompany us on our journey, God of grace, and receive the prayers of our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all.
Let us pray. Jesus, you are the bread of life and the host of this meal. Bless these gifts that we have gathered that all people may know your goodness. Feed us not only with this holy food, but with hunger for justice and peace. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast that renewed in the gift of baptism we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. and merciful Lord. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who, on the cross, opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he blessed it, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom, with you and the Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Bread for the journey, a feast for hungry hearts. Come.
May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Generous God, at this table we have tasted your immeasurable grace. As grains of wheat are gathered into one bread, now make us one loaf to feed the world. In the name of Jesus, the bread of life. Amen. Amen. Invite anyone that would like to receive prayer and anointing to join me in the front. Please stand for the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his face upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Go in peace. God loves you. Thanks be to God. God. We live.